When we read the suttas, we should remember that they were never meant to be read on their own. They were part of a community, the inherited knowledge of the community. In the old days, you would hear a sutta, and then you could ask the person reciting it, what does this mean, what does that mean? And they could fill in the blanks, because oftentimes there are quite a few blanks. You see this especially in the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. They're his most complete set of meditation instructions, and yet they leave a lot of questions unanswered. So we have to look around, read them in the context of other suttas, try to make sense out of them, and talk them over with people who practiced to get a sense of what they might be getting at. The first big question is, are the 16 steps meant to be read and practiced in line, in other words, 1 through 16? And the indication seems to be no. They fall into four sets of four, called tetrads. The first tetrad has to do with, directly with the breath. The second tetrad has to do with feelings. The third with the mind. And the fourth with dhammas. And it's not the case that you're going to focus on the body, and when the body's all taken care of, then you focus on feelings, and then wait until then. When the feelings are all taken care of, you focus on the mind, and then the dhammas. They're all going to be there. And the sutta itself, but the Buddha gives the most detailed explanation of these steps, it indicates as much. Just when you pay attention to the breath, the act of paying attention generates a feeling, or is a feeling, the text says, but it basically it helps to fabricate a feeling, what's called a feeling not of the flesh. As for the mind, there's no mindfulness of breathing without mindfulness and alertness. And as for dhammas, you have to develop a quality of equanimity to put aside all your other concerns. So as, even as you're first settling in with the breath, you've got all four aspects right there. And we can read them as instructions as to what to do. We should analyze what's the problem. You're trying to settle down, and it's not settling down. It's the problem of the breath, it's the problem of the feelings, the mind outside things coming in. Once you've identified the problem, then you can look at the appropriate tetrad to see what it is you might be doing wrong and what you can change. For example, with the first tetrad, the first two steps are to breathe in and out with long breathing, breathe in and out with short breathing. The next two steps are training. You train yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and out. And then with the fourth, you breathe in and out, calming bodily fabrication. Note in the words, the intentional element of the breath. The breath itself, the in and out breath. Now this can take you, this one step here can take you all the way to the fourth jhana. Another sutra says that when the bodily fabrication is fully calmed, that's where you're going to be, fourth jhana. That's a very brief outline of what, how you deal with the breath. There's a lot more that goes on, and John Lee would fill in quite a few of the details. When the Buddha says to be aware of long breathing and short breathing, you can expand that. You can include deep or shallow, heavy or light, fast or slow. And because you know from the second tetrad that you're going to be trying to develop a sense of fullness or refreshment and pleasure. You can use the variations of the breath to help induce that sense of pleasure. Then you're aware of the whole body as you breathe in. You train yourself at this point. It's something you have to get good at. A lot of people have trouble with this. They're focused on one spot, and then they try to be aware of the whole body, and very quickly find themselves back at one spot again. It takes a while to back into that sense of awareness that's filling the body all the time. You've got your spotlight awareness, and you've got your background awareness. What you're trying to do is bring the background awareness up to the fore. As for calming bodily fabrication, we learn elsewhere that before you calm things down, you should energize them, otherwise you just put yourself to sleep. 
So first breathe in a way that's energizing, and then allow things to relax. As your focus gets better, you can stay with calmer breathing and not lose your focus. If you find out that the breath gets too gentle, so you can't keep track of it, you have to breathe a little bit more heavily again. That's the breath side of things. Then there's the feeling side of things. You breathe in and out, training yourself to be sensitive to rapture. In other words, the, there are potentials for a rapture or refreshment in the body. Wherever in, in the body there's a sense of fullness. Allow that sense of fullness to stay. This just be the sense that it's full of blood or full of energy. There's a nice buzz in the, say, in your hands, in the middle of the chest. Allow that nice feeling just to be unaffected by the in and out breathing. So it gets a chance to grow stronger. As it grows stronger, then you can let it spread. Now, usually it's accompanied by pleasure. Sometimes, though, they're two different things. The sense of refreshment or energy spreading, because it'll be a little bit too much. So you figure out how to tune in to a more subtle level of energy that's just pleasant, and you let the excess go. And then the next step is to be sensitive to metal fabrication, which are feelings and perceptions. And the next step is to calm metal fabrications. This is where you find the perceptions come in to play a big role. You're trying to find perceptions that will create calmer feelings, because you're trying to go from rapture down to pleasure and then ultimately to equanimity. What kind of perceptions help? And John Lee recommends perceiving the whole body as saturated with breath energy flowing in different parts of the body. In some cases it flows up, some cases it flows down, circles around. So what way of perceiving the breathing would be more, most helpful to get things to calm down? Because when metal fabrication is totally calm, that can take you all the way through the formless jhanas. Here again we see how the, the different tetrads are not lined up in a row. The first tetrad delivers you to the fourth jhana, but then the second tetrad starts way back with the first, trying to develop sense, a sense of rapture. The third tetrad is the same. It starts with being sensitive to the mind. If you haven't been sensitive to the mind up to this point, you're not going to get anywhere. As the Buddha said, the mind is right there. It has to be mindful and alert. But maybe sometimes the mind is the problem. So you look at it, you get sensitive to the state of the mind. And then you notice, does it need to be gladdened, energized? Okay, breathe in a way that gives it more energy. Breathe in a way that gives a greater sense of rapture, well-being. Or sometimes you have to drop the breath and go to another theme that you find inspiring. Does the mind need to be concentrated, or do what you can to get things really focused? Does it need to be released from its burdens? These are the different steps you follow in that third tetrad. In other words, you read, the, you read your mind, and then you energize it, then you steady it, and then you release it. Those steps do follow in a logical order, but sometimes you have to jump around a little bit. And the release here, as we are saying this afternoon, it could be awareness release. In other words, simple release of letting go of sensuality or sensual thoughts for the time being, letting go of any other unskillful qualities for the time being, or letting go of, say, the factors of a lower state of concentration as you're trying to get into a higher one. It could also, though, mean total release, because that's what you want with the mind. You want bodily fabrication to be calmed, you want mental fabrication to be calmed, but you want the mind to be released. And then the fourth tread, tread gives you some idea of how to do that. First you start with inconstancy, you notice how things arise. And in the Buddha's descriptions of arising and passing away, he always says that your knowledge has to be penetrative. 
In other words, you don't just see things coming and going. You want to see why they come, why they go. And when they come, are they good? Are they the kind of things you want to encourage or not? That's what it means to be penetrative. It's in the very beginning. You may focus on inconstancies largely as an attribute of the things that are trying to distract you. Because the Buddha does relate this particular tetrad to putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And in his instructions to Rahula, when he taught Rahula breath meditation, even before he started with the first step, he had him contemplate various themes, one of which was inconstancy. This is where I use it. You suddenly think of something that happened years back, and you have to remind yourself, that's gone. I think of something you're anticipating in the future. Even when it comes, it's going to go. We've been searching for happiness in things that change, change, change all the time. There's not a time to look for something that's going to be more reliable. So you develop a sense of dispassion for the distraction, and it stops. And when it stops, you put everything down. So you don't have to keep thinking about how great it was that you were able to put that down. You put it down, and then you get back to work. As the concentration gets deeper, again, you're going from one level of concentration to another. You want to see the factors that you're dropping as inconstant, not worthy of passion, so you can put them down. And when the concentration is solid, and you begin to notice, even this has its inconstancy, the risings and fallings in the level of stress. You look into it. What's causing those? Why does the stress go up? Why does it go down? You see what's causing it to go up, and you realize you don't need that. You develop this passion for that. It's this kind of analysis that ultimately can set you free. So the four tetrads are there, not to be lined up in a row, one after another, to be lined up side by side. It's like a map with four pages. You fold it out, and there are four sections. And it's good to have the map, it's good to have it in the back of your mind. Don't put it in the front of your mind while you're meditating. That would be like trying to go through a forest looking at a map and just looking at the map as you're following the trail. You're going to run into trees. You're going to run into stumps. You're going to get bitten by a snake. You look at the map, get a sense of the general direction, you put it down, and you focus on the trail itself. In other words, you have the map of breath meditation in the back of your mind, but you've got the breath to the fore forefront. And you realize there are feelings right here, there's mind states right here, there are dhammas right here. And you're trying to get them together in a way that's calm and clear. And so you use this map to figure out what's lacking, what needs to be added. But it's this presence of mind with the breath right here. That's what it's all about. The map is there to give you an idea of how many facets there are to what you're doing right here, right now. Because that's an important part of meditation. You do the meditation, but you also reflect on what you're doing. And you realize you're not here just to be with the object, but you're also here to look at the mind as it relates to the object. Because that's even more fascinating than the object. The breath does have lots of details, especially the workings of breath energy in the body. But the way the mind relates to objects is even more fascinating. The way it falls for its feelings is even more interesting. The way it relates to itself is interesting. So you want to be aware of all these facets, because it's only then that you're Vision becomes all around. We're students of the Buddha who said, was said to have an all-around eye. He saw things from all angles. 
reflected on things from all angles. And that wasn't what enabled him to find a release that was total release all around. As he said, his mind was released everywhere. That's our teacher, and so we should try to follow him, see if we can make our own awareness all around, too. <laughs>